Okay, in this concept, we are going to try and get some physics out of the last concept, which was a bit of a mathematics, to be, to say the least. Uh, in the last concept, concept 5.6, we, we found the amplitude of a driven, damped harmonic oscillator, sometimes called forced um, harmonic motion. And uh, this is the amplitude. We also found the, the phase. The phase is the difference in the angle between when the, uh, the movement of the oscillator back and forth compared with the driving force. So, for example, the um, child on a swing has a natural frequency, omega naught, measured in inver inverse seconds. Natural frequency given by the square root of G over L for a simple harmonic oscillator with small amplitude oscillations. There's uh, a driving frequency also measured in inverse seconds or radians per second. That's the frequency of the pushing. So if the frequency of the push, it, I mean, nobody would think of not pushing at the same frequency if you're trying to get a child to go higher on the swing. But you can consider it, and that's what we do in this problem. You say, okay, well, let's say we're going to push at, at, a, at a rate that's different from the natural frequency. Let's say it was a little slow. So then on this push, I push uh, right at the right time to get the child to go higher. And then the next push, I was a little bit late. So I have to wait till he comes up uh, to, to his peak and then push a little bit later. And then a little bit later uh, on the next cycle, I would be even later and push. And you can see that uh, a frequency that doesn't match the natural frequency isn't going to lead to much in the way of amplitude. And this is what this calculation actually looks at. So. Um, that's the amplitude in the motion. The phase is the difference in the angle between the, the uh, pushing motion, the driving motion, and the natural frequency. Those might reach their peaks at different times. And um, delta is what, what determines the difference between the two. So what we're particularly looking for is to study the amplitude as a function of the, the uh, natural frequency omega, the frequency without any damping. Um, just in terms of defining everything, beta is the damping parameter. Also in inverse seconds. All right, this concept isn't too hard. There's a little bit of math to it, but it will uh, uh, show us a lot of physics. So we want to show that, that this amplitude reaches a maximum, and given by this equation, when omega naught equals omega. So we're actually proving that you're going to get the highest amplitude of motion. The child's going to swing as far as possible when you push at, or when the natural frequency matches the frequency of your, of your driving motion. Well, it's actually quite easy to see. You can just see it from here. This numerator of a squared is f naught squared. It's a positive number. The denominator, both terms in the denominator are either positive or zero. How so? Well, this term is a perfect square. If you square two beta omega, then you get 4 beta squared omega squared. So no matter what the values of 4, 2, and beta, and omega are, if you square it, you're going to get a positive number, or 0 if one of these is 0. So that's a positive number, or 0. What's this? Well, uh, 
it's got to be a positive or a zero, a positive number or a zero. Why? Because it's the square of something that's inside the parentheses. So whether this thing in parentheses is positive or negative, which it could be either, uh, once you square it, it's going to be a positive number or zero if uh, the stuff inside the parentheses is zero. So suppose that omega uh, not equals omega. Well, in that case, this term in the denominator vanishes. And the denominator being the sum of two numbers that are either positive, they call them positive definite. They're either positive or zero. <coughs> being the sum of these two numbers reaches its minimum value. How so? Well, if you're holding beta and omega constant and you're varying omega naught, then this term is just going to be a constant. You're going to vary this term because omega naught is varying. And once omega naught equals omega, this term is as low as it can get, zero, because it can't be negative. <coughs> so when omega naught equals omega, the denominator of a squared reaches a minimum. And if the denominator reaches a minimum, then the fraction reaches a maximum. You're dividing by something that's getting smaller and smaller, and you end up with something that's bigger and bigger. Now, there is a more uh, mathematically rigorous way of proving this. It's a little bit more painful, but if you treat A as a function of omega naught, and you look at dA by d omega naught, you take the derivative and you set it to zero. That's going to end up giving you either a maximum or a minimum. And what you can see if you do that derivative, it's a good exercise to go through, is that that happens when omega naught equals omega. It's just another way of proving the same thing that we just proved with this fraction. Okay, having now proved uh, that it reaches a maximum here, we now want to know what that maximum is, because that's what we're supposed to find here. Well. Uh, let's look at it. If omega equals uh, omega naught, or omega naught equals omega, a squared is f naught squared over, this term is going to be zero, like we talked about before, of 4 beta squared omega squared. Take the square root of both sides of that, you get. And that's our maximum, which agrees with this equation here. Our next job is to sketch the amplitude as a function of omega naught. All right, we know what the maximum is going to be. We know it's going to reach a maximum at omega naught equals omega. So if we plot A as a function of omega naught, we know that where omega naught equals omega, it's got to reach a maximum. And that maximum is this A max that we just derived. So we know it has to look something like this at, uh, at omega. So what does it do elsewhere? We're asked to sketch this amplitude as a function of omega naught. Does this amplitude go down through the axis and go negative? Uh, does it keep on approaching zero? Does it get bigger again and have another maximum or go to infinity? What does it do down here as, um, as omega naught goes to zero? The process of deciding what a function looks like is a very important skill. And 
a lot of all of you have calculators. You can uh, you can plug this into your calculator or use your computer and use Python or whatever your favorite programming language is, and you can find out what this thing looks like for a particular value of omega and beta and f naught. Well, what's more useful than that, and then that is sometimes useful, what's more useful though is to actually see how this depends on these parameters in the various limits. And this skill of taking various limits and looking what, at what a function looks like is an extremely, well, like I said before, it's an extremely important skill. I use it all the time in my research. And, um, and so let me show you how to do it in this case. Let's look at uh, omega approaching infinity, omega naught approaching infinity. All right, if omega naught's going to infinity, what does that really mean? Well, omega naught, omega and beta are all measured in units of inverse seconds. So what that really means is that omega naught is much greater than omega, and omega naught is also much greater than beta. So we're thinking about omega and beta being fixed. We're varying omega naught, and we're asking what happens when it gets huge compared to anything else. Well, let's take a look. Over here, um, if omega naught is getting huge, then omega naught squared will be even huger compared with omega. So you can ignore this omega squared term here, and you just get omega naught squared squared. So in that particular limit, we get a squared is f naught squared over omega naught to the fourth. It's squared and then it's squared again. Plus four beta squared omega All right, happy day. Well, the next step is to see if you can say anything about these two terms. Well, can you? Is there, is there anything you can say in the limit that omega naught goes to infinity? Well, sure you can, because here's an omega naught, it's going to infinity. And I've got four beta squared omega squared, and omega naught squared is gonna be large compared to beta squared. Omega naught, the other omega naught squared is gonna be large compared to omega squared. So this term is going to dominate over this term in that limit. In fact, let me uh, replace this equal sign with this right arrow, which just means this, in the limit omega not going to infinity. And so what does this go to? Well, so that's what a, a squared does. What does A do? A approaches, just take the square root of both sides, and we get f naught over omega naught squared. All right, omega naught squared is going, omega naught is going to infinity. What is omega naught squared doing? It's going to infinity even faster. And um, so you've got something that's going to infinity in the denominator, and so what does the fraction do? Well, if the denominator gets huge, the fraction gets small, and A approaches zero. But what's important here is that not, o not only do you know that it approaches zero, that's important to know, but you know how it approaches zero. That's where the usefulness is. We know that it pro approaches zero as one over omega naught squared, as omega naught squared goes to infinity. Well, a is going to go to zero as this uh, function. So as we get out here for large omega naught, <clears throat> I'm going to expect this to do something like that. You can also look at the limit uh, as omega naught goes to zero, and you can do that on your own time. Um, <clears throat> bottom line is it comes in at some omega, omega at omega naught equals zero. It's finite. It doesn't go to negative or go to zero. You can check on that. So now uh, let's take a look at what this A max, how this A max depends on beta.
So A max, what does it do as beta goes to zero? Beta goes to zero, A max goes to infinity, according to this equation as omega naught goes to zero. This is the undamped, or the weakly damped And in this case, we have a peak A as a function of omega naught, it's, ex it's extremely tall and sharp. So if this is, uh, this is A, this is A max, a max is getting huge in this case. And this is still at omega. And we get a um, tall, narrow resonance. And this is what we're talking about. We're talking about a resonance. If you're, um, what about the other limit? A max as, as omega naught goes to, I'm sorry, let's see. This was the limit as beta goes to zero. The absent-minded professor thinks A, writes B, and says C. We're talking about the damping here. We're talking about the dependence on beta. This is weakly damped case as beta goes to zero. Now we're going to talk about the uh, strongly damped case. What does A max do as beta goes to infinity? As it gets big. Well, A max is going to go to zero. This is the strongly damped case. And what does the resonance peak look like in this case? AMAC gets really small. And as you'll show in one of the homework problems, the peak gets broad. a short, broad resonance peak. So a little bit of physics. Um, I have all that math. This case here corresponds to the human vocal tract. We have strongly damped, the sound of my voice is created by vibrations of the vocal cords. And there's a column about 17 centimeters long between where the vocal cords are and the opening of the, the mouth of, of a human adult. It is about 17 centimeters, as I remember. And I can't remember that for sure. But anyway, the distance from here to there makes a, a kind of an organ pipe that's open on one end and basically effectively closed on the other end. Well, you can work out the resonances of an organ pipe, the natural frequencies. You can work out, you've all done this in elementary physics. Um, these resonances can be worked out for the um, vocal column as well. Uh, there's some subtleties to it because it's not really tubular. It's, it's bigger in places and smaller in others. But the essential difference between this vocal column and an organ pipe is the makeup of the walls. A, an organ pipe is made of metal or wood, typically, 
those materials are hard, some harder than others, but all pretty much hard. And so when you induce a vibration in that uh, organ pipe, either by blowing in the end of it, uh, uh, to produce sound as the, as the air hits a knife edge, it causes vibrations. Um, that sound isn't very strongly damped. We have um, pretty tall, narrow resonance peak in an organ pipe. You can't, uh, it'll, it'll hit its various peaks pretty, pretty carefully and there's not a lot of damping. Uh, not so in the human voice. The, um, the walls of the vocal column are soft, soft tissue. And so when, when your voice, um, vocal cords vibrate, they not only vibrate the air inside the column, but they also vibrate the tissue, that soft tissue in the column. And that dissipates energy and gives you a large beta, a lot of dissipation in, in that problem and broad resonance peaks. These are called formants in the human voice. And they're the basis behind vowel production, for example. A, A, E. I'm changing the shape of my vocal column and changing the positions of these formants uh, accordingly. But they're very broad because of the, the strong damping that occurs in the walls. Uh, this is what you'd see in, in an organ pipe. This is also what you would see in, um, in the case of you're pushing a child on a, on a swing because there's not much damping going on there. Maybe a little bit of um, damping from the air, maybe a little bit of uh, friction from where the chains reach the top pole of the... Um, so it would look a lot more like this. The other uh, example that we can bring up this is so ubiquitous, this forced harmonic motion, is an LRC circuit. So here we have a voltage source, an inductor, a resistor, and a capacitor. And what's oscillating in time is the current in the circuit. And if you work this out using E and M, you end up with the same equation apart from just different definitions of constants. You got an X double dot term, you got an X dot term, and you got an X term, and then you got a forcing term on the right hand side. The equation looks the same. And the physics is the same too. L and, and C determine the natural frequency of the undamped uh, circuit, and that's one of the square root of LC if you work it out. That's a natural frequency. If you drive it, drive this circuit with uh, a signal generator or you plug it into a wall outlet or whatever, and you're driving it at a frequency that's different from this natural frequency, you won't get the maximum current um, in this circuit. Remember the current's oscillating clockwise and counterclockwise, etc. But the amplitude of those oscillations is what we're interested in. Um, and this is, in fact, the physics behind the, um, a radio receiver. In the old, old days, you could build, in fact, I've built one myself, what they call a crystal radio set. Um, you don't need any power to receive radio signals. They provide all the power that you need. You get rid of this um, source, and you simply um, connect up this circuit like that. And then the radio waves from a radio antenna, radio tower, comes, come in here, change the magnetic flux through the circuit, and induce currents in the circuit. And those currents are governed by the same rules of physics that we have here. If the uh, damping is low, then uh, here's where the damping occurs in the resistance. So you can determine the, the damping parameter using the, res the, the resistance R. If it's low, if, that res if you use a small resistor in the circuit, you're going to get sharp peaks. Uh, if you use a big resistor, you're going to get really broad peaks. And in thinking about a radio receiver, if you have um, a FM 90.5, I think is... Um, National Public Radio, 
that's 95 megahertz. Um, but you can you have another station, presumably at about 90.7, another one at 90.3. So you want to be able to tune your radio at a particular frequency, and you want to account for the fact that sometimes circuits will drift because the, the capacitance, the inductance, the resistance might depend on conditions, especially resistance. Um, the, the frequency of that receiving circuit might drift around with time or it might not be perfect. Um, so you want to have some breadth to your, um, to the, to this resonance peak. If it's too narrow and sharp, then you're only going to be able to tune into that radio station if you're right on, exactly agreeing with the frequency. On the other hand, if you go um, too broad, you put too much resistance in that circuit, then when you're listening to a particular frequency, you're going to be able to hear, if this is say 90.5 and this is 90.7, you're going to be able to hear both stations at the same time. They're bleeding in from... Uh, so you want a happy medium between a really, really sharp peak and a really narrow one. And the, the, the peak width, typically, I believe, the, the way that these would be designed would be that the peak width, the full width at half maximum, would, would be of the order of the distance between the frequencies in your spectrum that you're trying to keep separate. And that's it.